can see here that the filter is on on ADMX and network so the only settings I'm looking at are the ones that applied to that filter I just created. I'm going to open up this one that says allow ICMP exceptions. Now first thing you notice is that the previous and next setting are moved. Everything about this looks a little bit different. Let me point out what, what, what specifically is cool. The help contact is already part of the window. You don't need to go to a different tab. This is a lot of things. If you have new people in your organization and they're not used to the settings, or people who think, for example, that this allow ICMP setting is the same one, or allow ICMP exceptions is the same one as the one above it, reading the help will make sure that they're distinguishing between which one they should be uh, configuring. So less clicking, everything available when you first look at it. As soon as I click enabled, you can see that these options are already enabled for me to, to check them. What's interesting about this is that now I have fewer things that are popping up, right? The key here is to be able to work faster. I don't have to click through a lot of tabs. I don't have to go through a lot of pop-up menus. And this was a big one at MMS. The window is now stretchy, whereas before it was static. You couldn't do anything about it. Now you're able to stretch it out, and you get rid of that scroll bar so you can see all of the content you want at one time. So this is just an example of what the settings look like, but there are a bunch of new settings also. And I want to let Michael talk about some of those new settings. Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the new settings that we've got now in um, Windows 7. So a lot of this stuff you'll have seen before, and every time we do a Windows release, we release a few more bits and pieces. So the new bits and pieces that we've got in Windows 7. Now Adam's already talked about AppLocker. He's already interviewed someone on TechNet Edge, so you might want to have a look at that one. But we've got group policy support for this new function we call AppLocker, which is essentially like software restriction policies, but now we can do whitelisting and blacklisting um, of applications and be very explicit around what applications we will support in our environments. We can support that through group policy. We've got some new stuff in here around auditing. So if you remember before, um, the audit capabilities were really based out of um, some of the security settings up here. And if you remember some of that audit capability, it was, wasn't really granular at all. Um, now, when we released Windows Vista, there was some new audit capabilities released in Windows Vista, but those audit capabilities weren't policy enabled. They were very much a command line thing through a tool called auditpol.exe, and you controlled auditing in that manner. Well, now that audit policy is now exposed through group policy. And the good thing here is we can control it and we can report on it as well. So, for example, we might want to control some of the account log on stuff. Um, we can now audit, you know, say things like our credential validation. We can, you know, audit success and failure, but we can audit lots of other things as well. For example, you know, stop okay. So inside DS Access, um, there's a number of things I can now do. So if you remember in DS Access before in the standard auditing, if I switched that on, it would simply tell me an object's changed. Whereas now in DS Access. I can go into audit directory services changes and I can do the same thing as I did before, success and potentially failure if I want to see the DS access. But the big difference here is when you look under the explain text. Previously it would just tell you something had changed. Now what we get the ability to do is not only see when something's changed, but we can see what the value was before and what the value of that change is after. So we get the full auditing capability so we can see the impact. So it might be that a user's name changed and it changed from Michael to John. Well, we now can see the previous attribute value of Michael and the new attribute value of John. So we can see all that stuff, whereas we couldn't see that before. So we, that's all new in Windows 7, to, to be able to light that up. And that's supported from Windows 7, Windows Server 2008, um, R2, as well as Vista and Windows Server 2008, just the, the previous release. So we get that down-level capability. Unfortunately, it's not supported on Windows XP and Windows Server 2003 because those platforms never had that capability to do um, the advanced audit policy um, changes. We've also got some new settings to support a new function that you might have heard about on TechNet Edge already, a tool called Direct Access. We can now define settings for direct access through policy. So for example, all the DNS settings we want to support on our client machines so that they can use direct access, which is that new capability where we can just come straight into our corporate network. We don't have to necessarily VPN in. Our machines just behave whether they're in a Wi-Fi cafe, um, 
you know, like they're on our local LAN. It just, it just simply works. Well, all those settings are delivered through group policy now as well. So some of you might be kind of sitting there thinking, well, that's great. You've got all these new Windows 7 and, you know, previous version Windows Vista capabilities. Does that mean I've got to upgrade all my policies to be able to support this? And the answer is, for the most part, no. You don't have to change your policies at all in, that, in, in order to be able to support Windows 7 and Windows Vista. Though there are some situations where you may want to actually um, tweak some of your policies and separate some of the functions. For example, that audit policy capability, well, the old audit policy also works up level. So all the old stuff you may want to, to block. And there are some technic articles which tell you how to stop Windows XP policies flowing up to Windows Vista and Windows 7, um, and vice versa. You can also um, make sure that the Windows XP policies aren't applying some of the new stuff as well. Though it's important in some cases to separate those things out to make it a bit clearer. Another example is the Windows Firewall, where we brought some changes in in Windows Vista to be able to um, support IPsec and the Windows Firewall in a single stack, in a single IP stack. Well, in XP, that never was, was available. So you had to separate out your um, IPsec settings from your Windows XP firewall settings. And in some cases, those settings can move up level to Vista as well. So in some cases, it's a good practice to just separate out those auditing and firewall IPsec settings so that we don't have an impact between versions. But for the most part, other things like Internet Explorer, etc., work up and down level without any sort of problems at all. And so you don't necessarily need to have this concept where you upgrade your policies. Um, and similarly, you don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, how do I get my domain controllers to support this new functionality as well? Because group policy is not really based around domain controller support. Um, you don't really have a domain controller dependency. Though again, in some cases, you may have situations where um, schema is required to support some settings. For example, BitLocker key escrow. Um, you do need to update your Active Directory schema, though not necessarily your domain controllers. So those are some of the new Thanks settings. so much for tuning in. Um, you're more than welcome to come check out our blog at blogs.technet.com slash group policy. Michael and I have a friendly competition for who can post more, what's more useful, and, um, and you know who can make the blog better. So please tune in and let us know what you think about that. Leave comments, ask questions, etc. So we took a look at some of the new stuff in group policy specific to R2 and Win7. Didn't go into a lot of detail on some of the bigger pieces like PowerShell and um, the preferences work. If you'd like to see more of that, by, let us know by adding comments either on Edge or on our blog. Um, PowerShell, in order to see all those commandlets, make sure that you say import-module group policy at the beginning of every console session or you won't have them. Um, and for preferences, to be able to manage them, like I said, they should just be in the box for 2008 R2 and they're in the box for 2008 as well. So the other stuff we talked about today were some of the new settings. We didn't touch on too much uh, about the rest of the work, which is basically with starter GPOs, which was first introduced in 2008 and is now in the box in R2. But other than that, I think we talked about everything that, that's really cool and new in group policy. So we're keen to hear from you guys. You know, if you want to see some more of this kind of stuff, we're happy to do you know, whatever sessions you like. You know, whether that's showing you the new stuff or whether it's just helping you to troubleshoot group policy. And some of the recommended sort of <laughs> <laughs> and some of the recommended things that um, you know you'd want to see us do. For example, you know how to troubleshoot, how to how to you know what's the best practice stuff mm -hmm. um, that you'd want to see. How to get started? What is loopback? What is inheritance? Talk to me about precedence. Any of that stuff. So if any of that seems like you'd want to hear our voices and see our smiling faces talk about it. Uh, let us know. Or if you don't want to see us, you want to see somebody else talk about it, we'll have to rustle up some folks and see. But uh, let us know in the blog or on the edge.